Good morning, Crosspoint family. Uh, welcome to our time of worship together, even though we're not together. Uh, the Lord is at work, and he's good, uh, even during a pandemic. And so I hope you guys are well this morning. Um, I've asked my friend Molly Law to read our call to worship uh, this morning. And so she's going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Join me for the call to worship. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Hey friends, this is all the poor and powerless. Shout it, go on and scream it from the mountains, go on and tell it to the masses, he is God, shout it, go
Go on and scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses He is God Good morning, Cross Point family. This is David. And Laura. We miss seeing you all and hope you're staying safe and well. And we look forward to when we can fellowship with you again. <laughs> hey, Cross Point family. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mary Gatliff. I'm Jesse. I'm Ellis. Alice. And I'm Catherine. <laughs> we miss you all. We miss Bye. you guys. <laughs> Good morning, Cross Point family. I hope that. Um, you're each finding joy and rest in this season, um, and I miss seeing y'all at church. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hey y'all, Amy Cook here. Just wanted to say I really miss everybody, and I pray that the Lord is giving you his peace during this very interesting time that we're in. Take care. Bye. Hello, Cross Point. Uh, this is Marilyn Dish. Uh, I miss seeing everybody. Uh, I hope we get to be together soon. I hope everyone is safe and well, and I wish you all the peace of Christ. Good morning, Crosspoint family. It's Paige. I miss you all, and I can't wait to fellowship with you all again. Hey, good morning, Crosspoint family. Um, just FYI, this is so hard, uh, recording sermons on the phone. I have so much material for the blooper reel um, that you'll probably never see. But anyway, okay, I love you guys. Um, hope you guys are doing well this morning and miss being with y'all. Um, let's just go ahead and jump into this, okay? So we have been in Exodus this uh, spring, and last week was Easter, Easter Sunday, and we took a little break from Exodus and we kind of followed the Apostle Peter around through three Gospels, and we kind of looked at the Easter story from his perspective. And actually, I would like to do that again this morning. Um, so this is kind of like Easter part two, and then we will jump back into Exodus next week. Uh, and Exodus, we it'll take us all through, it'll take us to the end of May, and then we'll do something different uh, this summer. So I've asked my friend uh, Ellie Beloy to read the passage for this morning. So she is going to be reading John 21, verses 15 through 19. And so let's listen to the word of the Lord um, through uh, Ellie's uh, reading. John 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, so during this stay-at-home time, uh, I've been catching up on ESPN's documentary series uh, called 30 for 30. And this past week, Amy and I watched the one on Michael Vick. Uh, Michael Vick was the quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons in the early 2000s. And if you're not familiar with Michael Vick's story, uh, his football career was tragically interrupted by his own illegal and immoral behavior. Uh, sadly, uh, Vic and others were running an underground dogfighting enterprise. 
And when the feds raided his home in Virginia, uh, they found over 70 dogs in cages. Gruesome details of abuse and torture and execution of underperforming dogs galvanized animal rights activists and, and just outraged uh, people all across the country. And so under intense pressure, Michael Vick turned himself in to the authorities, was tried, was found guilty, and sentenced to 23 months in federal prison. Uh, he went from the highest paid player in the NFL to wearing an orange jumpsuit pretty much overnight. And he wasn't even uh, 30 years old uh, when all this happened. When he was released uh, from prison during the summer of 2009, he was unclear and uncertain of what his future would be like. Like, how would he re-enter society? Like, he was hated uh, and despised by many, many people. Uh, would he return to the NFL? Would he play football again? And would he be restored and accepted? So last week, we looked at um, this Easter story through the eyes of Peter. And Peter had, like, this Michael Vick experience. Um, although it didn't involve animal cruelty, but his, his experience actually was far worse. Um, last week we saw the devastation of like Peter's like betrayal and denial of Jesus on the very night that Jesus was arrested, the very night that Jesus needed his friend, Peter, uh, when confronted with, Hey, aren't you one of those guys? What, don't you know him? Peter was like, Jesus, I've never heard of him. And he did that three times. Um, he did that just hours after uh, Jesus' arrest. Uh, Peter's denials were intentional. Uh, and they exposed the depravity of Peter's own heart. And by the way, you guys, we're all Peter here. Uh, all of us are capable of denial and betrayal and all kinds of nefarious things. That's how deep the rabbit hole goes of, of the human heart. We're all Peter. And so uh, last week I read this passage. Let's listen to how Luke, uh, the gospel writer, records uh, the third denial and what happens right after that. So this is Luke 22, uh, where Luke says, And immediately, while Peter was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Uh, the line that really always grabs me from that particular passage is where Luke says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Like, what in the world? was being communicated by that look uh, between the two of them. Uh, by three o'clock uh, that Friday afternoon, uh, Jesus, who is the eternal son of God, he's fully God, he's fully human, by 3 p.m., uh, he was dead. And Jesus, he suffered, he died, and he paid, uh, he paid, for Peter's sin, so that Peter would be made right with God. But after the resurrection, which we saw last week as well, after the resurrection, what happened to Peter? Like, yes, his sins were paid for, he was forgiven, um, but would he be accepted? Would, be, would he be restored um, by Jesus? Or would he be kind of cast uh, aside? <clears throat> Would he be kind of cast to the margins after the resurrection? So this morning, what I want us to do is kind of look, I want us to look at how Jesus gently relates to and restores this broken man, Peter. But first, uh, let's set the scene, uh, kind of the bigger picture of John chapter 21. 
So at this point in John's gospel, the risen Jesus has already appeared to the disciples two times. And what strikes me about all this is that these guys, these disciples, they go back to their normal lives as fishermen. Like, how do you go back to like normal life after you witnessed the brutal uh, arrest, mockery, flogging, uh, and crucifixion of Jesus? And then three days later, he rises again physically from the dead. Like, how do you get up in the morning and just go, I'm going to kind of go on to my normal day? Uh, these guys do that. And they return to something that was very familiar to them. They return to fishing. And so uh, a group of them are hanging out, and Peter says, hey, who wants to go fishing? And they said, we're in. So they go fishing all night, and they catch nothing. The sun begins to rise, and there's this guy standing on the shore of the beach. And he hollers at them. He says, hey, fellas, uh, did you guys catch anything? And they holler back, uh, no. And so the dude on the shore says, hey, throw your nets on the right side of the boat, and there you will find the fish. So they did that, and then they were not able to pull in the net because of so many fish that they caught. And actually, uh, John tells us exactly how many fish they caught, 153, which is unique. Uh, because in the first century, if you were writing a fairy tale or a fable or like a moralistic story, you wouldn't include details like that. And so the fact that that little detail is there, 153 uh, fish in the net, uh, that is a signal. Uh, that is a sign that the writer is saying, hey, what, what I'm writing here happened. This is history. So that's kind of neat. So one of the disciples that's in the boat uh, is John, who wrote this gospel. And he says to Peter, he goes, Peter. Peter, it's him. It's, it's the Lord. And so what does Peter do? He hurls himself into the sea and swims towards the shore. Now, can you imagine the rush of adrenaline that, was, that Peter experienced here? Like, this is the part of the movie that kind of goes into slow motion, and then like a Mumford and Sons song kind of fades in to kind of capture the joy. That's what's happening here. And when they all arrive on the shore, Jesus offers them something that many people love, brunch. So he's got this little charcoal fire pit set up. He's grilling some fish. He's got some bread for these guys. And the disciples wistfully trade glances with one another, like as if to say, can you believe this? Like it is really him. And then Jesus breaks the silence by looking at Peter, and he asks him in front of the other disciples. He says this, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And you guys, this is Jesus being Jesus, like a skilled counselor. He asks Peter a question that brings him to the depth of his being. And notice that Jesus doesn't call him Peter which is the nickname that Jesus had given him three years prior, which means the rock, Peter the rock. Rather, Jesus calls him by his birth name, Simon, son of John. And perhaps Jesus is gently reminding Peter here that after what he's done, his like his three denials, that perhaps Jesus is reminding Peter that, hey man, you've kind of lost your street cred. Um, and you're, and maybe you being called Peter the Rock isn't appropriate or appropriate right now. So that might be what's going on here. Or perhaps Jesus is just addressing Peter like a dad, like a father addresses a son who's wandered away from home and now is back. And he says, he calls him by his birth name, like Simon, son of John. And so Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
And what is he really asking him? He's saying, Simon, son of John, do you really love me? After all that has happened, can you truly say that you love me? Do you love me more than these other guys do? Again, like put yourself in Peter's shoes here. Like think of what's racing through his mind. Like the last time that Peter was standing at a charcoal fire was the night that Jesus, I mean, was the night that Peter denied Jesus three times. And here he is at another charcoal fire. But this time fear isn't ruling Peter's heart. Love is. And so Peter says, to Jesus' question, he goes, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Okay, so there's there might be some play on words happening here. Uh, in the Greek here, John is, uh, well, in the Greek in general, there are several words for the word love. And two of those Greek words are used here in John 21 in this conversation between Jesus and Peter. And so the word for love that Peter uses is different from the word for love that Jesus uses. Isn't that interesting? And so Jesus uses the word agape for love, which is like a, it's a strong word for love, like deep, deep intimacy and affection, like unconditional love, like a very, very deep love uh, is what agape means. But then Peter uses a softer word uh, for love. He uses the Greek word phileo. And so uh, Peter, fully aware of his failure, he kind of downplays his language here. So like his self-confidence has been shaken and all he can get out is, I phileo you. Um, and so Peter says, Lord, I have an affection for you. I can't say I agape you because of what I've just done. And so all I can get out is I phileo you. And Jesus's follow-up is feed my lambs. That's how he answers Peter's answer. And we'll come back to what that means uh, here in a few minutes. Again, Jesus asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And there's that Greek word agape. Peter's answer, yes, Lord, you know that I love, phileo, you. Jesus' follow-up, tend my sheep. Again, for the third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time, Jesus uses the word phileo, uh, perhaps in a way to kind of get down on Peter's level and, and speak his language. And so Peter, after this third question, was grieved, um, and he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, phileo. And Jesus' follow-up to that is, feed my sheep. Okay, so do you see what Jesus is doing here? He looks at Peter in the eye, and he says, now he remember, Jesus is doing this in front of the other disciples that are all, they're all there witnessing this. And what Peter is doing, I mean, what Jesus is doing for Peter it's, it's as if Peter is like this little kid who's disappointed his dad. And all he can do is just look at the ground. Like he's, he's looking at the ground and saying, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. And I think Jesus kind of stoops down and gets on Peter's level. And he kind of, you know, picks his chin up and he says, hey, Peter, look, look at me, son. And he says, look. It's okay. It's okay. You are forgiven. And you're not orphaned. And you have a seat at my table. And you have a role to play in my kingdom. My grace for you, Peter, is restorative. Remember when I invited you to be a fisher of men? Uh, those three three years ago, I'm reinviting you into that, although I'm changing the metaphor a bit from catching fish to now tending lambs and feeding the sheep. Um, not only will you be a fisher of men, Peter, but I'm also calling you to be a pastor, to be a shepherd to the sheep. 
And I love this because that's what Christ has done for me. That's what Christ has done for many of you. You guys, the best shepherds, the best pastors and ministers are people like Peter. Broken and humble people knowing that they need a shepherd themselves in order to shepherd others. Uh, Jesus graciously brought Peter to his knees and he restores, he reinstates Peter into a humility that is needed for shepherding the sheep. Has he done that for you in your life yet? I love how Jesus brings Peter and the rest of the disciples here, like kind of full circle. Like when they first met most of these guys, they were blue collar fishermen. And three years later, they're still fishing. But most of these men, no, actually all of these men, they're not the same guys as they were three years prior. Um, and especially Peter, uh, he's not the same man as he was three years ago. The last thing Jesus says to Peter is actually the first thing that Jesus says to Peter, and it's this, follow me. And so for the past three years, these dudes had an experience that forever changed, transformed, and altered their lives as they followed Jesus. So this is like that scene in Return of the King when the hobbits returned to the Shire. I'm not going to go into all the plot points of The Lord of the Rings. I'm just trusting that you at least have heard of this book and film series. Um, but in this scene, uh, these four hobbits, they left the Shire 13 months ago uh, on an adventure to save Middle Earth from Sauron. And they basically, these guys had gone, they had basically gone to hell and back. And in this scene, uh, they're back where they started in the Shire. So let's watch this, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Thirteen months to the day since Gandalf sent us on our long journey, we found ourselves looking upon a familiar sight. We were home. I love that scene because so much is spoken, but with no words. And these hobbits have just had this amazing and dangerous experience of saving Middle Earth. And they're the only ones in the Shire that kind of actually really know what happened. And here they are back in the same pub. But they are not the same hobbits anymore. And the same is true for these disciples. Uh, especially for Peter uh, at the end of John's gospel. Yes, they are still fishing, but they are not the same. Jesus had completely transformed their lives. You guys, um, Jesus meets us where we are, and he changes us. And for some of us, it happens overnight. For many of us, my, like myself, it's a progressive journey of change. But Jesus is changing us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. He wants to do that 
for us, and he does it for these guys. So let me ask you a question. Again, feel free to answer this out loud wherever you are. But this morning, do you need the restorative grace of God? Like some of us have walked away from the Lord much like Peter did. Even in that one night, he, he wandered off uh, from the Lord. Some of us have wandered off just for a night. Some of us, it's been a season that we have been apart from him. If that's you, if that's where you are this morning, or if you've experienced something like that, I want to invite you to lean into this passage. And I don't care what you've done. Like you may have done something years ago and you've hidden that secret uh, deep inside um, and nobody knows that except the Lord. Um, the Lord is saying to you, no matter what you've done, he's saying, I can forgive all of your sin and I can take that crushing weight um, that you carry around upon yourself. And then he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then soak in my love for you and share that love with the other sheep and follow me. That is the invitation of grace. That is the invitation of the gospel for us. Okay, let's kind of bring this down to the lower shelf and talk about how Peter's story and restoration connects to our story and restoration. You guys, in Peter, we kind of see this tension of the, Christ, the Christian life. Like one day we're affirming him and worshiping him, and then the next day we wander off and we deny him. Uh, yet Jesus invites Peter and us to feed and tend the sheep. And this invitation isn't just for like professional pastors. Uh, Jesus is calling all of us to follow him and to feed and tend the sheep of the church. Like your calling to do that will look completely different from mine. Like you guys have uh, gifts and skill sets that I don't have. And the body of Christ, the church on earth needs you working together, right? Um, we're all working together for one purpose, for one goal, and that is his glory. Um, kind of shining the light on him and pointing others to say, like, don't look at me, look at him. Like, look and follow him. And so that's what the gospel is calling us, all of us, into. But here's, here's the hook that I kind of want all of us to kind of hook into this morning. How does he do that? How does God, Jesus, how does Jesus, like, accomplish that? For the church, and he does it this way. He calls broken, inadequate, and weak people like Peter to feed and tend the sheep, the flock of God. Like Peter is like the big the biggest failure here, yet he becomes one of the main and chief leaders of the early church. And his strength and leadership flows out of his weakness and his dependence upon the Lord. So remember, I told a story weeks ago. Remember my friend in Tryon? Um, I asked her to pray about being a small group leader. And her knee-jerk reaction was, um, I can't lead a small group. I smoke. Why are you asking me to do this? And my response to her was, well, first of all, because you just said that, um, there's a humility in you and a dependence in you that I see. So that's, that's awesome. And then I said, you know the gospel. And then I said, yeah, I mean, it might be a good idea for you to quit smoking. <laughs> but the smoking doesn't disqualify you in leading a small group. The smoking is bad. It's unhealthy. It's probably, it's not a good thing. Please hear that clearly, especially my boys. Um, but it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't, it didn't di disqualify her from leading a small group. And Peter was just like that. His inadequacy, his weakness made him adequate for what the Lord was calling him into. 
And so following Jesus and doing ministry in his name, feeding the sheep, means a deep humility and a deep dependence upon the Lord. And sadly, many, many, we live in a culture where many pastors have become celebrities. And they have grandiose and narcissistic personalities. And they see ministry as an arena of performance. And they use and they abuse the church to accomplish their big dreams. That's not what Jesus has in mind uh, here when he's calling Peter to be a shepherd, to be a pastor, to tend and feed the sheep. Um, to, to tend and feed, feed the sheep, it means that pastors, ministers, all of us, we serve, we love, we know, we pray for, we go after, we laugh with, we cry with, we listen to, we winsomely challenge the sheep that the Lord has given us to care for. You guys, ministry and pastoring people, it is slow and steady work where we depend solely on Jesus working through us. And you guys, we only do that when we are hanging with the chief shepherd. When Jesus is shepherding us and we're soaking in that, then our shepherding kind of flows, it flows out of that. Okay, back to Michael Vick. Whatever happened to him? Like, did he play football again? Did he play in the NFL again? Was he restored and accepted by the community? The short answer is yes, he was. Um, the, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Eagles, they hired him um, in 2009 to be their backup quarterback. And then in 2010, um, go back and watch some of the footage of Michael Vick in 2010. It's unbelievable. In that particular year, he was given the NFL Comeback, um, what is it called? The NFL Comeback Player of the Year Award. So that happened. And then, this is shocking, he became a spokesperson for the Humane Society. And he would go to schools and he would go to communities and he would speak out against animal cruelty. And you guys, that wasn't like a one and done thing. He genuinely felt remorse about what he had done to these animals years before. And he continues to work for and speak for on the behalf of the Humane Society throughout the country. Uh, Michael Vick is living a restored life, much like Peter and much like many of us. So let me close uh, by reading something that Peter wrote actually many years after this conversation with Jesus in John 21. And what I want you to listen to, this is, um, listen to Peter's pastoral tone. You know, Peter gets a bad rap. Uh, we always joke about him, like he's the he's the disciple that kind of puts his foot in his mouth and he says things. He's abrasive. He He's impulsive. Listen to what he writes here and how God changed this guy's life. So this is 1 Peter chapter 5, just a section of this. And this is, uh, so just kind of, I'm going to read this. Please don't tune out. Tune out. I know it's, it's easy to tune people out when they're reading, but listen to Peter's tone, okay? He says this, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow. That is so good. And you can, you can hear how Peter kind of weaves his past failures into his present and future redemption. Can you hear the hope of the gospel in Peter's words? You guys, God has a wonderful plan for us. He does, like even in the midst of a pandemic, and um, he wants to restore us. He wants to gently restore us, and he does it without shaming us. In fact, he takes on the shame himself, and he wants us to use, um, he wants to use us to display his glory and to tend and feed the sheep that he's given us, not through our strengths, but through our weaknesses. So let's uh, pray together. Lord, thank you for uh, this story uh, in Peter's life. And I see myself so much um, through the story of Peter. Um, my heart's just like his. And you uh, pursue, uh, you come after uh, people like Peter, people like me, people like my friends. So, Lord, we uh, pray that you continue to do that uh, through the grace and mercy of Jesus working um, in and through our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
now receive this benediction from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hope you guys have a restful Sunday and we'll see you next week.